Well, welcome everybody to Paramook 2019. Um, as you know, this is Parapsychology Research and Education, Survival of Death and Parapsychology. We started our, uh, the live session started on April 6th and we'll continue through May 19th. Enrollment opened in March and we'll close on May 31st. And the only reason why that's important is if you have friends who would like to join us, anyone who enrolls in the course by uh, May 31st will have access to all of the recordings and materials and everything else uh, until April of 2020. Um, and maybe maybe even longer. I want to say thank you to the Parapsychology Foundation, especially Lisa Coley, its president, for the support that they provide to the Paramook so that we can bring this course to you on an annual basis. And you guys know me. And I'd also like to say thank you to Brian Williams from the Psychical Research Foundation, who's our discussion forum co-moderator. Today's lecture is Dr. Phil Morse, and it's called The Amazing Unimpeachable Mediumship of Lenora Piper. He is a professor emeritus from the State University of New York at Fredonia, an author or co-author of five books and numerous scholarly articles, and has been listed in Who's Who in American Education, Men of Achievement, and Outstanding Americans. In addition, he was a visiting scholar at the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University and the University of California at Berkeley. He is presently affiliated with the Ryan Research Center, where he has done research on psychokinesis, survivalism, and energy healing. And today's talk, Leonora Piper was probably the most studied and scrutinized medium ever. She profoundly impressed people like William James and many other luminaries of her day. And remarkably, no one could ever raise even the slightest doubt about her ability to communicate with those who had passed over. She had an acute ability to mesmerize people with her knowledge and accuracy of information that was sometimes unknown to even the sitters. Hold on a sec, guys. Okay, okay, that's a break in the <laughs> in the YouTube video. She had an acute, Leonora Piper had an acute ability to mesmerize people with her knowledge and accuracy of information that was sometimes unknown to even the sitters. Her quiet, unassuming manner and impeccable integrity has stood the test of time to this day. And we're all grateful to her husband who let her travel to England to be tested and work very hard at her craft. So let me move over to Phil's, um, PowerPoint, Phil, if you can go ahead and click on that microphone again and open up your mic. There you go. And I'm going to put you up in the top spot and get out of your way. And the floor is yours, Phil. Okay. Thank you very much, Nancy. Um, if the top of my head looks a little ghostly, there's a skylight right above <laughs> my head. And uh, as clouds pass over, <laughs> it may or may not, uh, it may uh, disappear or come back. So, at any rate, uh, it's my pleasure to be able to talk about Leonora Piper today. Um, she's really a fascinating individual. Um, oftentimes when someone has, uh, when the time's transpired and time goes by, uh, we tend to forget some of the most uh, remarkable things about some of these individuals. But um, as Nancy read, um, Leonora Piper stands alone as the one medium who not only gave often stunning and accurate details about her sitters' lives and those close to them, but sometimes uh, providing facts that even the sitters didn't know about until verified later, which as we will get into later, uh, is, sort of is, is a, a way of dealing with the uh, arguments of super psi and a lot of this coming through telepathy. Uh, she was exhaustively uh, investigated by many top authorities and, uh, and really investigated as much as any medium ever was. And she was never found to have engaged in any fraud, which is uh, really one of the few things that you can say uh, about her. So our journey will detail the facts and the life of this remarkable individual. So uh, she had a childhood which uh, sort of began uh, at age eight, well, it began earlier, but at age eight, she had a vision concerning the death of her Aunt Sarah, 
Uh, as it turns out, her aunt actually died about the time she had the vision. So this was sort of the first indication that uh, she had some paranormal abilities. Uh, she started demonstrating mediumship uh, in Boston shortly after her marriage. And it really began when she visited a medium uh, and healer named uh, J.R. Koch. Uh, she was seeking relief uh, from recurring pain uh, caused by a childhood accident. Um, at that particular time, Mrs. Piper fell into a brief uh, trance state. Um, and then on her second visit, uh, she fell into a, a deeper trance. And at this time, something kind of dramatic happened. Uh, she rose from her chair and located a pencil and paper and began to write a note. And this is the contents of the note. Uh, it was directed to a Judge Frost, uh, who happened to be present at the time. And the message of the note claimed to be uh, from Judge Frost, the deceased son, uh, and contained very detailed and accurate information, which impressed Judge Frost a great deal. So shortly after that, uh, Piper began holding seances in her home on a regular basis, and uh, word of her ability spread throughout Boston and the northeastern region of the United States. Uh, she continued her mediumship, um, often despite serious physical illness, until about 1911, at which time her power seemed to diminish uh, gradually. So just uh, very, very briefly, I'll just explain uh, basically Mrs. Piper's mediumship. Um, as is often the case, she manifested two different types of personalities. One uh, which is uh, traditionally or usually called the communicator. And that's an alleged discarnate spirit of a former living person who sends messages through uh, a medium, the medium. And then there's a control. And that's oftentimes a personality uh, manifested during the uh, trance states of the medium that assists with contacting the spirit world. Kind of, uh, I would describe it as kind of an afterlife uh, telephone operator who sort of uh, coordinates the, uh, the uh, messages that are coming uh, usually from the communicator. So um, basically uh, Piper's controls and the communicators spoke through the medium by taking control of the, of the medium's vocal organs. In this case, it certainly happened with Mrs. Piper when she was in a trance. And also, uh, interestingly, uh, sometimes simultaneously or uh, written messages were uh, produced at the same time, uh, either through the arms and hands of the uh, medium, uh, often called uh, automatic writing, and uh, Piper's first consistent control happened to be uh, an alleged French doctor named Finuit. And this particular control dominated uh, Piper's uh, seances until about 1892, whereupon at that time a new uh, control appeared uh, by the name of George Pelham. And uh, that came up uh, a little bit later. Uh, he lived in Boston, uh, he was a lawyer, Liter literary and philosophical interests, and uh, he also had been an acquaintance of several members of the Society of Psychical Research. So I just wanted to show you an example of uh, automatic writing uh, by Mrs. Piper. Now, I realize this is probably, <laughs> it looks a little illegible, so I will sort of uh, try and uh, decipher it uh, with you. Uh, this says, oh yes, <laughs> It's a little bit, uh, you, get, get a little, you have to get a little creative about reading that. And then it says, Blackbird, uh, I said, just for fun. And then it said, well, Carrington, old chap, I am glad to know you. And so this is what uh, Mrs. Piper and many of the other mediums did uh, spontaneously, just started writing. And, and again, this is uh, called automatic writing. Now, in the early phase of Piper's mediumship, uh, the Finuit control communicated uh, her voice, and this gradually gave way to a greater reliance on automatic writing. Again, as I said, uh, they often say sometimes would uh, happen simultaneously, or one would prevail over the other. So in some cases, uh, as I mentioned, the voice and automatic writing were used at the same time 
Uh, and in one case, uh, this was actually uh, basically uh, observed um, by Mrs. Piper. Uh, one communicator delivered a message through automatic writing with Mrs. Piper's left hand, while another communicator was communicating a different message with her right hand, uh, while Fenua was talking through her, and all were occurring simultaneously. So this uh, basically is, is what sometimes happens. So I want to just go over quickly uh, a little bit the researchers who studied Piper because they uh, actually had uh, a significant role in later uh, research uh, studies uh, involving Mrs. Piper. And I want to emphasize in particular um, the uh, preeminence and the um, actual uh, basically uh, luminary, the luminaries in the field that they happened to be. All of them except one in this case was from uh, distinguished universities, uh, William James from Harvard University. He remains famous to this day. Uh, he wrote several classic texts and Richard Hodson from Cambridge University. We'll talk about him in a minute. Then James Heislop, he's from Columbia University and uh, he basically taught logic and ethics and was a prominent member of the American Society of Psychical Research. Sir Oliver Lodge, uh, again, uh, a distinguished uh, member of uh, Liverpool University, and he actually was involved, uh, he was a physicist who was actually involved in the development of the radio, which is uh, very interesting. Frank Podmore was a uh, prominent skeptic um, who uh, basically uh, had a lot to say, and later on I will just indicate just how important he was in terms of uh, Mrs. Piper. And finally, Frederick Myers. Frederick Myers uh, was also at Cambridge University. Uh, he was one of the founders or co-founders of the Society for Psychical Research. And he was the author of the classic book, uh, Human Personality and Survival of Bodily Death. He had a lot to do uh, with something which I will get into a little bit later, uh, which is called cross-correspondence. And all of these individuals uh, really were involved in one, one way or another with the uh, investigation and research of Mrs. Piper's powers. So uh, shortly after her rise uh, in popularity, uh, she came to the attention of Harvard psych psychologist and philosopher, William James, as I just mentioned. Uh, his wife had heard about Mrs. Piper's strange powers through her maidservant who knew Mrs. Powers' maidservant. This is oftentimes what happens is sort of uh, comes through the grapevine. And uh, James was also one of the founders of the American Society for Psychical Research. And, just in, you know, in addition to being distinguished for a lot of his writings, in fact, he would end up publishing dozens of articles, about 500 pages worth on topics related to psychical research, including um, Mrs. Piper's mediumship. So uh, just very briefly tell you a little bit about uh, what, how he got involved with Mrs. Piper. At the age of 43, uh, he had 12 impressive initial sittings with uh, Mrs. Piper. This was back in uh, 1885. And at that time, she revealed uh, intimate details uh, about James' life and his uh, own life, or James's family and his own life. And uh, subsequently, he uh, sent 25 different people to Piper as sitters, uh, often, oftentimes making sure that they, well, always making sure that they had never met Piper before. And oftentimes, the sitters were introduced on separate occasions uh, at, under uh, pseudonyms, uh, as we will soon see uh, one of them uh, was named Smith. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and. Piper consistently provided uh, correct and highly detailed information about the deceased relatives of the sitters and demonstrated an intimate knowledge of the lives of the sitters. So um, this really impressed James a great deal. He was naturally a skeptic, as oftentimes scholars are, uh, basically a curious skeptic, but also open to seeing what was going on here. And he wrote the following about his first personal sitting uh, with Mrs. Piper. He said, my impression after his, this first visit was that Mrs. Piper was either possessed of supernormal powers or knew the members of my wife's family. 
by sight and had by some lucky coincidence become acquainted with such a multitude of their domestic circumstances that to produce the startling impression which she did. And then he uh, goes on to say, or to conclude, my later knowledge of her sittings and personal acquaintance with her has led me to absolutely reject the latter explanation to believe that she has supernormal powers. This is a letter to Frederick Myers in 1890. Now, for someone of James's stature to say something like that, uh, it took quite a leap because um, his reputation was at stake and uh, there had to be a lot of proof um, to really uh, convince him that basically what he was saying here, super, that uh, she had supernormal powers. So uh, later, uh, James's report, the one I just read on Piper, inspired uh, the British researcher, James Hodson, to come to America and begin a detailed investigation of Piper. Now, Hodson, as I mentioned, uh, was from Cambridge University, and he was a leading member of the Society of Psychical Research in England, and he was recognized as an expert in detecting fraud, uh, and he had on several occasions exposed fraudulent mediums. So uh, he moved, he actually moved to Boston in 1887 and began a thorough investigation of Piper, which continued until his death uh, in 1905. And uh, he came, as I said, as being uh, a real skeptic. He actually wanted to prove that there's something fishy about what Piper was doing. He wanted to kind of expose what she was doing. And his work uh, involved the analysis of the results of well over a thousand sittings, which is pretty impressive, hundreds of which uh, Hodson himself participated in and presided over, and he often worked with uh, other uh, researchers in, in terms of these endeavors. So uh, just very briefly, uh, some of Hodson's uh, investigative techniques, uh, <laughs> some of them uh, almost bordered on the, uh, the uh, comic. Uh, he hired a private detective, for example, to spy on Mrs. Piper for several weeks to ensure that she was not inquiring information through agents or other normal means. Uh, as I mentioned, the sitters were often introduced under pseudonyms, uh, and they were selected by Hudson himself to make sure that uh, they didn't know Mrs. Piper at all. Uh, Hudson, interestingly enough, uh, with the permission of her husband, took Mrs. Piper to England in the winter of 1889 and 90 to provide further assurance that she had no prior acquaintances with the sitters. This was kind of an extraordinary move, but he did indeed do that. And then he also tried to craft questions uh, which the sitters were, did, not, did not know the answers to. And I'll show you a little bit later the significance of that. So, so um, basically, uh, after all this was said and done, and uh, Mrs. Piper did, uh, was in a, entered into a trance state for many years, uh, no one doubted that it was genuine. Um, and part of the reasons were that, uh, <laughs> this sounds a little extreme, but uh, she could be cut or blistered or pricked or even have a bottle of ammonia held under her nose without having it disturb her at all. Uh, <laughs> they went to extreme lengths in those days to really demonstrate, uh, I guess, uh, her being in a, in a trance state. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Mrs. Piper also spoke or wrote foreign languages, uh, depending upon the uh, communicator, uh, foreign languages that she did not know. And when she came out of her trance, uh, she remembered nothing of what she said or did. So that was another interesting part of this. Now, what I'd like to uh, do is to go uh, through with you briefly um, something called the khaki sittings. And I want to show you a little bit uh, just how Mrs. Piper operated and just the amount of detail that she got into and some other characteristics of a sitting. Uh, in December of 1883, uh, Hudson booked two sittings with Mrs. Piper for the Reverend Mr. and Mrs. Sutton. Now, the Sutton's daughter was named Catherine, uh, nicknamed Khaki, and she had recently died. Now, the, uh, the precise cause of Khaki's death, uh, we didn't really know for sure, but she had a fatal illness involving a severe uh, sore throat and a swollen tongue. So um, 
Tacky had two brother, he had a brother named George and two sisters, Eleanor and Margaret. And uh, her sittings were, her siblings were still alive, but they were not present at the sittings. So the, son, the sons brought with them to the sittings uh, various items uh, which belonged to their daughter, uh, such as buttons or a silver medal, uh, just as a way of sort of um, introducing uh, intimate objects that her daughter possessed. And they also were introduced, the Suttons were also introduced under the pseudonym Smith. Uh, and they had never visited uh, Mrs. Piper before. Uh, I might add that there was a uh, present um, Mrs. Howard, who was an expert note taker, uh, who carefully recorded all the sittings from, uh, for Hudson. And uh, Finuit, I'm just setting this up for you so you sort of see what the characters are. Uh, Dr. Finuit was a control and claimed to have made contact with Khaki at the beginning of these sittings. Uh, so Fenuit either spoke or gestured on behalf of Khaki throughout each of these two sittings. And I'll try to indicate how this works. So I'll, I'll sort of give you some selections from the actual transcript of the uh, sittings. So uh, Fenuit, and this is coming through Mrs. Piper now, uh, Mrs. Piper is speaking, uh, or Fenuit is speaking through Mrs. Piper, says, a little child is coming to you. And uh, with open arms, Fenuit or Mrs. Piper uh, Mrs. Piper has her arms open and says, come here, dear. Don't be afraid. Come, darling. Here's your mother. So Fenuit proceeds to describe the child as a young girl. Now, this is all the uh, vertical information that begins to be assembled here. Uh, he, he said that the young girl had lovely curls, and she indeed did have apparently very striking curls. So Khaki says, uh, through Fenuit, uh, through Mrs. Piper, uh, where's Papa? Want Papa. And Finuit takes the silver medal from the table and uh, Khaki says, I want this, want to bite it. So Khaki uh, used to bite things uh, apparently, or to, you know, she was fairly quite young. And uh, then reaching for a string of buttons says, quick, I want to put them in my mouth. And uh, she used to uh, do that also with buttons. Um, and then Dodo was uh, Khaki's uh, nickname for her brother, George. And so again, uh, she said uh, through Mrs. Piper, this is Fenwick speaking, speak to me quickly. I want you to call Dodo. Uh, tell Dodo I am happy. Cry for me no more. And uh, gesturing with hands to throat, this is Mrs. Piper again, uh, no sore throat anymore. Uh, I indicated earlier that she had a pain in her throat and tongue before she died. And then uh, she says, Papa, speak to me. Can not you see me? I am not dead. I am living. I am happy with Grandma. And apparently, Khaki's grandmother had been dead for many years, so she indicated that she was with her. And then Finwood says, was this little one, little one's tongue very dry? And she keeps showing me her tongue. And apparently uh, her tongue was paralyzed before her death. So again, this was Mrs. Piper uh, going through these, uh, you know, going through these motions uh, as Fenwood speaks through her. And then Fenwood says uh, her name is Catherine, uh, calls herself Khaki. I already indicated that. And then she says, where's Horsey? Uh, and after Mrs. Sutton pulls out a little horse, hands it to uh, Mrs. Piper, uh, and then... <laughs> She says, big horsey, not little one. And Khaki here refers to another horse that was hidden away at the house that she secretly loved. And Mrs. Sutton had forgotten about that and realizes this later. So this again sort of reinforces um, how specific this was um, and how all this really was uh, real facts. So then, he, then she says, dear Papa, take me wide. And do you miss your khaki? Do you see your khaki? The pretty white flowers you put on me, I have here. I took little souls out and kept them with me. And so Fenuit, uh, through Mrs. Piper, describes here on khaki's behalf, the lilies of the valley that were placed on her khaki, on her casket. And then um, she says, Papa, want to go wide horsey? I like that horsey, I go to ride. And apparently Khaki had asked all during her sickness to ride on her horse. 
So Mrs. Sutton asks, do you remember anything from the day you were brought down the stairs? And Khaki through Fenuet or through Mrs. Piper says, I was so hot, my head was so hot, which was correct. And then Eleanor, I want Eleanor. So this was, again, this was, as I mentioned earlier, this was Kathy's little sister, whom she asked for regularly during her illness. And she said, I want, I want my buttons. And then she suddenly says, row, row, my boat, sing it now, I sing with you. And apparently this was a song that Kathy, that Kathy sang during her final days alive. And so touchingly, <laughs> The family joins in singing the song with uh, Finuit a la Mrs. Piper, but Khaki finishes the last verse of the song by herself. So then she says, where is Dinah? I want Dinah. And that was the name of Khaki's rag doll. And then she says, I want Baggy. And that was the name of her sister, Margaret. I want Baggy to bring me my Dinah. These were all uh, substantiated as being facts being true. And then finally she says, I want the tick tick. And she uh, opened the tick tick, mama. Do you love me so? I want to see the muley cow. Where is the muley cow? Take me to see it. And apparently tick tick was Khaki's name for clocks. She was taken almost daily to see the cows, which she referred to as muley cows. And then finally she says, I'll put my hand on Papa's head when he goes to sleep. What's a Bobby? That's uh, Khaki's pronunci pronunciation of her doll, another name. And then finally, uh, Fenwick takes the doll and says, she wants it to cuddle up to her, so she wants to sing to it, bye, bye, bye. So the actual transcript was considerably longer, but I, uh, I, was, I got into this uh, in considerable detail to show you just how accurate she was and how she really didn't miss any details at all. And so uh, this is, I, I just try to go through a, a number of points, which I think uh, illustrates just how uh, Mrs. Piper impressed so many people. Um, it, but without fail, she exhibited a very vivid and detailed knowledge about Khaki and her family. This was one thing. And then Finwit, uh, through Mrs. Piper, was able to speak and gesture on behalf of Khaki. Uh, he actually, uh, he made it, he, he, he communicated in a way that made it seem as if Khaki was the ultimate source of the information. And uh, oftentimes the, uh, the medium will take the voice actually sounding like the person who uh, is speaking. Um, and there's also linguistic features like you want to go wide horsey. This comes from a a very young girl, two-year-old, I guess she was. Uh, and then also, uh, without fail, similar expressions with idiosyncratic pronunciation or syntax. So this, again, sort of uh, indicates the extent to which um, this was really uh, very accurate and detailed. Uh, in terms of gestures, in the second sitting, Khaki asks for the little book. It's, uh, it's actually a prayer book. And that's from which Mrs. Sutton read during the latter part of Khaki's illness, and which Mrs. Sutton placed in Khaki's hands after Khaki died. So Finwit, uh, Finwit uh, through Mrs. Piper gestures by putting Piper's hands in the same position as Khaki's at death. Then uh, further points here, Finwit knows Khaki's nicknames for family members, uh, Brother George, uh, Dodo, Sister, Margaret, Baggy, as well as Khaki's unique names of objects such as Dinah and Bobby, Clock, Tick Tock, Cows, Muli, Cow. These are all specific things very unique to uh, the uh, individual here. And then Finuit uh, exhibits specific interests and desires indicative of, of Khaki. For example, wanting to sing her favorite songs. Uh, play with specific toys, uh, seeing particular things which Khaki enjoyed in life, such as the muley cow. These were all very, very uh, idiosyncratic to Khaki and would be unlikely to have Mrs. Piper know this. Uh, and then finally, the flow of the conversation uh, doesn't allow much, if any, fishing for information. It was all just, you know, spot on. It therefore creates the impression of an actual discarnate person who was engaged in conversation, uh, which is uh, appropriate for her age and experience. So 
So anyway, uh, that's that's fairly typical of uh, the kinds of um, uh, basically medium readings that Mrs. Piper demonstrated and what impressed people so much. Um, so the sittings basically demonstrate uh, how effective she was with the information and the manner of delivery. And as I mentioned, uh, the trans personalities are capable of exhibiting characteristics of the deceased that could not be accurately ca captured uh, through the mere transmission of information. The tone of the voice, the kinds of ways that they said certain things, uh, identification of possessions, all those kinds of things made it very uh, specific to the person. So now I want to just uh, give you an example of three or four sittings where telepathy could not have really uh, come into play. And this is fairly important in terms of what people have uh, investigated. It's sort of the super psi business of uh, sort of saying that, well, the sitters could uh, communicate through telepathy to the medium uh, this information. And these are some cases where it really <laughs> was not really the case. And I'll try to uh, just give you a couple of them here. Um, now, this, this I'm going back to some of the researchers or some of the authorities that I mentioned. Sir Oliver Lodge is one, and he had a, he had an uncle Jerry, so he sat in with Mrs. Piper. A lot of these uh, you know, luminaries actually had readings with Mrs. Piper. And his uncle Jerry had been dead for 20 years, and Lodge took out a gold watch with him for a sitting uh, with Mrs. Piper that his uncle Robert, who was a brother of Uncle Jerry, had in his possession. And Lodge was told that Uncle Jerry almost immediately threw Mrs. Dr. Finwood, or in this case, uh, again, Mrs. Piper, that it belonged to him. So then Lodge suggested or asked that it would be good if, Mrs., if Uncle Jerry, the deceased person, provided some trivial details of their boyhood so that his brother Robert would be convinced it was him. So Uncle Jerry, uh, through Mrs. Piper, mentioned swimming in a creek where they uh, were boys together. Uh, apparently they killed a cat in Smith's field, possession of a small rifle, owning the snakeskin, uh, just little details which would help uh, show that it was indeed um, Uncle Jerry. And so uh, Robert, uh, who, um, who uh, the person basically, uh, let's see, it's, um, yeah, Sir Oliver Lodge, uh, basically Robert, when, Sir, when Lodge talked to him, had a distinct recollection of everything except killing the cat. So uh, he asked another brother named Frank, several brothers in this family, uh, without telling him why or providing any specifics to see whether he could remember the details of their all swimming in the creek. And Frank did happen to remember all the details, including the killing of the cat that Uncle Jerry cited. Uh, the only thing they didn't was the snakeskin. Um, so the killing of the cat couldn't have been telepathy because Uncle Robert uh, didn't remember that. Now, there's another case. Uh, this is, again, going back to uh, James uh, Hylop. Um, that I mentioned earlier, uh, he had a, um, a seance with Mrs. Piper and Heislop's deceased father came through and apparently through Mrs. Piper, he talked with his son about discussions that they had when he was alive. The father asked, what do you remember, James, of our talks about Swedenborg hypnotism and apparitions? And James remembered it all except discussing Swedenborg, but when he brought it up with his stepmother, she remembered it well because she didn't know who he was and had asked her husband about him after James left for the day. So this is a further substantiation of uh, the fact that it was indeed or could be uh, the deceased father speaking through uh, Mrs. Piper. This is another case, uh, again, involving, uh, involving Heislop, uh, had with his deceased father. Uh, it involved his father identifying an old friend who had been involved in a dispute uh, over putting an organ in their church. That's again, a, a, a little detail. And this was outside the scope of mental telepathy also because Islop knew nothing about the incident until he verified it uh, with uh, relatives later on. 
Another deceased uncle of Hyslop, Dame James, um, and this is a, another sitting with Mrs. Piper. He told Hyslop that he despised the nickname, nickname Jim. So Hyslop wasn't aware of that, but when he checked with a living cousin, who was one of James' daughters, she, she told him that her father indeed did not like being called Jim. So again, this is a case where it really couldn't have been telepathy because Hyslop didn't really know about it. Uh, a few more cases. This is a lady named Robbins who received advice from a deceased physician uh, named Director about uh, some health issues, I guess, that she had. And he told her that he lived in Boston and had died in Paris a year or two earlier. Now, Robbins knew nothing about this. She was just there to get some information uh, from a deceased physician. But Robbins later uh, determined that a physician by the name given her by the deceased had lived on Beacon Street in Boston and had died in Paris the uh, preceding September. So again, uh, telepathy could not have been in play here because she knew nothing about any of the uh, facts uh, when she was sitting with Mrs. Piper. Uh, the facts were verified later. Now, I just wanna just quickly talk about cross correspondences for a minute. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Frederick Meyer uh, had a significant part of this. In fact, uh, he was the one who I think uh, invented it or basically came up with the idea along with uh, a few other people like this person named John Piddington. Uh, he asked uh, Frederick Myers, who was then deceased, through Mrs. Piper to attach a sign to a message Meyer, Myers would send to different mediums who did not know each other. Now, you'll see in a minute what he was trying to do here. He Now, again, P Pennington was sitting uh, with Mrs. Piper in a seance and, or having a sitting, and uh, the deceased Frederick Myers came through. So Pennington suggested uh, when uh, he was talking with um, Frederick Myers through Mrs. Piper, he suggested a circle with a triangle in it. So... Uh, Pittington received just that through the automatic writing of another medium named Margaret Vral, 12 days after his request to Myers. And then three months later, he received from another medium named Mrs. Fleming the same sign. Although interestingly, her, with her, this, the triangle was not in the circle. So you can see what, uh, what they were trying to do here. Uh, there was no correspondence at all between the sitters in this case. Uh, neither medium knows anything about Pennington's request to the deceased Myers. Uh, and the latter sent, uh, Myers sent the same sign to two different mediums who do not know each other and uh, were not in communication. So this pretty much takes away the idea of telepathy going on or the argument about super side. One final case I'll give you, this is a particularly... Uh, striking one, in my opinion. This didn't happen to involve Mrs. Piper, but it's the same sort of thing that uh, she brought up or, or dealt with a lot, so I'm using it as an example. This, again, involves uh, Sir Oliver Lodge, one of the people, one of the authorities I mentioned earlier, and his wife, Mary Lodge. Um, she had They had a son named Raymond who was killed in uh, World War I. And when they went to a medium, um, their son sent them a message where he referred to a group for a uh, photograph in which he was holding a walking stick. However, neither Oliver nor Mary could recall any such photograph. So they were very puzzled. They went to another medium uh, and asked Raymond, the, the deceased son, for more details about the photo that he alluded to. And he was able to communicate again through this other medium that it was a group photo of his army unit, that he was sitting down, he was sitting down while the others were standing, and the person behind him was leaning on him. Well, this is the uh, striking thing about this. Four days after the sitting, they received a letter and a photograph from the mother of one of Raymond's fellow officers. And Raymond was sitting uh, with a walking stick across his legs and the arm of the man behind him was resting on his shoulder. And the photo had in fact been taken three weeks before Raymond's death. 
So this is the sort of thing that kind of uh, is pretty, pretty uh, compelling as far as establishing a case for uh, survivalism. So coming back to our friend, Mr. Hudson, uh, after 12 years of investigation, now this is a very <laughs> dogged individual who really wanted to uh, smoke out Mrs. Piper uh, if he could. Um, and however, he concluded uh, that Piper had genuine mediumistic abilities and that she was actually in contact with the discarnate spirits of those who had died. Now this is a big thing for him to be able to admit because his professional reputation depended or sort of counted on as being able to uh, find out fraud in mediums. So I'll just read what he said. He said, during the first few years, I absolutely disbelieved in her power. I had but one object to discover fraud and trickery of uh, unmasking her. Today, I'm prepared to say that I believe in the possibility of receiving messages from what is called the world of spirits. I entered the house profoundly materialistic, not believing in the continuance of life after death, Today, I say I believe. The truth has been given to me in such a way as to remove from me the possibility of a doubt. So researchers such as William James and Hudson all were convinced that Piper had not engaged in fraud. Remember Frank Podmore? He was a gentleman that I alluded to earlier. Uh, he was a, he was a well-known skeptic of the day. And he ended up also being convinced that Piper was not engaged in fraud. This is what he said. Uh, Mrs. Piper's trance statements are so precise and the possibility of leakage to Mrs. Piper through normal channels, channels in many cases so effectively excluded that it is impossible to doubt that we have here proof of a supernormal agency of some kind, either telepathy by the trance intelligence from the sitter or some kind of communication from the dead. The trances of Mrs. Piper furnish the most important evidence which the SPR has yet adduced for the existence of something beyond telepathy. So that's an important statement, which basically uh, deals with a super psi uh, argument. This was not telepathy. So Hodson suddenly died in 1905. He had uh, amazingly investigated Piper for 18 years. And curiously, a week after his death, uh, a new control appeared in the Piper seances. And guess who it was? Hodson. <laughs> uh, communicating through Piper, uh, Richard Hodson assured friends and family that he had indeed uh, survived death. And the Hodson personality appeared on numerous occasions to different sitters for the better part of a year. So this was, again, a rather uh, significant or interesting thing that happened. Um, Finally, the Evening World, which was a newspaper at that time, uh, wrote on Saturday, February 1st in 1908, Mrs. Piper is now over 50 years of age, a tall, statuesque, placid woman with only a common school education. And in the same article, the writer states that Professor James believes that the messages actually come from the spirits claiming to transmit them. Well, it wasn't exactly... <laughs> James uh, was always quite cautious uh, because he wanted to, pres I think he probably wanted to preserve his academic, academic reputation, but he was in fact uh, convinced that Piper knew things that could only have discovered, been discovered by supernatural means. And so he expressed this now famous statement about Piper's mediumistic abilities uh, as being genuine by saying, if you wish to upset the law that all crows are black, it is enough if you prove that one crow is white and my crow is Mrs. Piper. So that's a famous and rather definitive statement about um, uh, a famous person, uh, James, uh, basically concluding that Mrs. Piper was indeed genuine. So uh, I'll recommend to you a very uh, good book uh, on Leonore Piper if you're interested. I'll hold it up here so you can see. Um, it's uh, called Resurrecting Le uh, Leonora Piper, How Science Discovered the Afterlife. It's written by Michael Tim, a very engaging and detailed description uh, about uh, Leonora Piper's life, some of which I used uh, in this presentation. So if you'd like to uh, get it, it's on Amazon. Okay, I think that basically is the essence of uh, my presentation on Leonora Piper. I guess I'm ready now to take any 
uh, questions that anybody might have or comments or whatever. Folks, if you have any questions, please put them in the um, in the chat box. Uh, and Carlos, if you'd like the mic, uh, let me know. Thanks so much, Phil. Um, she's an astonishing, uh, has an astonishing record of so much information uh, coming through that was verifiable. It's a, uh, and, and this, as, as you were saying at the beginning, this reputation for, um, kind of the ideal woman of, of the end of the 19th and early 20th century. And, um, uh, so, and very unassuming and very cooperative and very patient with all of the, the experimental kinds of uh, experiences that she went through. Yes. Uh, and that's produced a, a, a quite a lot of um, evidence that that's, uh, stands up today as well. So people are saying amazing person, uh, current media, um, Brian says great presentation, thank you so much. Um, Adelson is saying current mediums tend to be mental mediums, um, whereas Leonora Piper and others at the time were considered trans mediums. What explains this difference? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, there's not as many trans mediums today, uh, and you're right, um, there's more mental mediums. Um, I guess at that time, this was about 100 years ago, uh, there were a lot more trans mediums. And, uh, and Nancy, do you want to make any comments about that? Well, I, I think it's, a, and Marla can speak to this too, I think uh, um, Marla is a, a, a one of our uh, longtime students who's, who's uh, done mediumship training that mediumship training today doesn't emphasize trance in the way that it did um, back in Leonora Piper's um, day or in the day of, of, uh, of Eileen Garrett, who was trained that way as well. And uh, today it's more of an open and awake and aware kind of medium and uh, mediumship. But I think that it's basically training and maybe the propensity of the individual um, rather than, than, uh, than being one of these hard and true things about how these things work. I think it's pretty individual. I, others in the chat may know more about this than I, than I do, but that's been my impression over the, over the years. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, just one, I just want to point out one question that came out. I think it's kind of interesting. It says, uh, would there any be a, would there be any Leonora Piper today? <laughs> Which is an interesting question. Uh, Quite honestly, I don't know of anyone. There is a few uh, well-known mediums who are very accurate today. Uh, and uh, I, uh, again, Nancy, do you have any thoughts on that, or anybody that you could can you can you think of? Well, um, not really. Other than the, uh, I think that Julie Beichel has had quite a bit of. Um, mm quite a bit of success with a number of people that have gone through her program in terms of accuracy and accuracy is kind of a key um, a point in their training procedure and whether or not somebody uh, who gets brought into the certified mediumship program um, makes it over that home. Um, Lizette is saying that uh, back to the issue of trance versus uh, modern mental, mental mediumship, Lizette is saying that Garrett was prima primarily a trans medium but with age could do mental mediumship as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, Margaret is asking whether or not uh, accuracy would have something to do with the level of, of, of trance. Mm -hmm. Carlos, if you want to weigh in too, that would be great. Would you like your mic, Carlos? I'm just putting in the link for Windbridge Research Center so they can see some of the information about um, is it org or I'm not sure if it's org or anyway. Yeah. And Marla is saying, um, let's see, let me get back up there. In my mediumship class, every student in my class was afraid to let go of their own consciousness and allow a spirit to fully take control of their body as a true physical mediumship. Well, I know in, um, uh, Eileen Garrett's books, and Lizette would be able to speak to this better than I, in uh, Adventures in the Supernatural and some of her other books, she she talked about her training, and um, the gentleman that trained her uh, warned her off of physical mediumship because he felt that it could take away from the mental mediumship uh, uh, 
uh, side of things and be a, a distraction or even maybe a hindrance to being a mental medium. And certainly Mrs. Garrett was very, very accurate as well. Mm -hmm. um, Adelson has an interesting question here. Have you ever heard of anybody making any attempt to contact the deceased Leonora Piper? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, and I don't, I don't have an answer to that. I, I'm not aware that anybody has, but it would be a very interesting thing to to have somebody do that. So, uh, yeah, I think it, what his his additional comment was maybe discarnate mediums are able to provide remarkable information about the other side. Um, um, I haven't heard from Carlos yet, but um, some of the skeptics back uh, back then suggested, this is from Pat Padin, um, that Piper's mediumship abilities may not be genuine. In one case, for example, psychologist Stanley Hall invented a fictitious niece and Piper came up with some real information. So what would your opinion be about this? Um, Stanley Hall, yeah, he was one of the people that was quite, uh, he was quite uh, suspicious about all this. Um, I don't. I don't know the details actually of what he did. Um, I'm not sure. I think uh, Piper did come up with some genuinely uh, good things about that, didn't, didn't she? I, I'm not quite sure what the details are of so Stanley Hall. Yeah, sorry. I, I sorry. I was poking my head out the door to um, see if Carlos wanted his mic. Um, I remember a long uh, article, and I I haven't. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where in Skeptical Inquirer. Um, I think back in the '80s, maybe Carlos can correct me or Brian on this one, that uh, uh, sought to basically knock down everything that had to do with the Pelham. Um, the George Pelham part of Leonora uh, Piper's mediumship. And I don't remember the details, but I do remember it was roundly criticized on our side for um, picking and choosing um, uh, particular facts and leaving other ones out that were disconfirmatory that showed uh, more about how uh, accurate she was. So it went back and forth. And I, I think that the skeptical community uh, considered it to be a complete um, uh, uh, debunking of Piper's mediumship, whereas on our side of the line, even the experimentalists were saying, hold on a sec, that's yeah. not exactly accurate. And there was, there was a number of um, discussions. I'm not sure if it was in the comments of, uh, uh, or the letters to the editor after that paper appeared, um, or where it was over, you know, how well this this critique had gone. And I, in 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 my uh, fuzzy impression of the era, um, Leonora uh, Piper's reputation came out completely unscathed, essentially from that that particular, at least on our side of the line, right, from yeah. that particular co uh, controversy. Yeah, yeah um, right. It was it taken, a lot of this was out of context, you know, and that's part of the. Part of the thing, of, you know, there's, there's a way that people can really manipulate the facts and, you know, the, the, the statements in a way that looks kind of, you know, the way they would like to have it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. So, okay. But now, but it also mentions, and this is this is certainly something that researchers into into mental mediumship are aware of and worry about. That um, when he brought up when uh, Stanley Hall, who was Stanley Hall, spent a lot of his youth running around. He was of this. Uh, I think a, I think he was a bit younger than William James, but in that same era where uh, mediumship was everywhere, and a lot of the uh, the wealthier people and wives of Harvard professors and all this kind of stuff were doing a lot of. Not to mention William James, were doing a lot of in investigation. And Hall was on a on a tear to see for himself. And the majority of his experiences were negative because there were a number of fraudulent mediums around and people taking advantage of people's interest in spiritualism, especially in the US and um, uh, I would assume also in the UK. Um, by the time he got to this, this particular seance, he had his kind of his methodology fairly uh, figured out and doing this is that um, uh, doing this like bringing up someone that's not a real person and trying to elicit information from the medium and showing how this is an imaginal 
kind of an episode that the the the, the medium is consciously or unconsciously um, pulling up information in a variety of different ways to to bring the sitters what they want and what they need. On our side of the line, we would it, we would hold open the possibility that some of these things had to do with telepathy of the of the sitters and what was in the sitters' minds and hearts and so on. And on on the skeptical side, it was just an indication that okay, every single thing that every medium has ever said in the history of time must be wrong because. Uh, this particular medium took the bait, but yeah. the but the reality is that it just like uh, past life regression, mediumship sittings are a mixture often of of uh, both the the imagination and the 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 um, um, the knowledge that is being gleaned by the by the medium his or herself unconsciously or consciously but in this case i would say probably unconsciously that you're you're putting together something to answer the call that you're getting and because the the medium themselves is not awake and aware and you know this is their unconscious talking so it's a little more unfettered than yeah be in their their waking state um these kinds of things came came forward but they certainly come forward in, generally in situations where other ver verifiable non-imaginal um uh, uh materials are coming through and that's true both in uh the physical mediumship of say sapia palladino she was kind of a mixed bag mm -hmm. if, if if you controlled her correctly, you could still get uh, physical uh, physical events in the medium in the mediumship in the sitting that were verifiable. And I think this was also true of, of mm -hmm. uh, mental mediums. So while uh, uh, I think skeptics have the opposite of, of James's notion of the one white crow that you prove the existence of white crows by seeing just one yeah. for them it was well if, if there's one black one then they're all black period i don't care what i see <laughs> how white the crow is in front of me if i've seen a black one, they're all black so it's kind of an absolutist way yeah. of looking at the topic and and stanley hall was a profession builder in psychology who was concerned in in taking over the apa and coming to, you know building up all kinds of uh, various subdisciplines in psychology, which he did very effectively, and also bringing forward this: we're scientists, and we're not, you know, duped by the what poor old muddle-headed William James is duped by. So there was a lot of identity building going on with Stanley Hall. He has a, yeah. a big reputation of being um, very concerned about how central he was to psychological practice of the time. So while a lot of what he did was important and could be useful. He was also, in my opinion, um, much more likely to dismiss anything uh, uh, on, in an absolute way. It's either all perfect or it's it's all, it's just uh, it's just wishful thinking. So I think he's he's an interesting guy to look into, and Amy Tanner, his graduate student as well, mm -hmm. um, in terms not only of their methodology and trying to uh, uh, show the 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 failures or foibles or uh, lapses in me mental mediumship, but also their motivations and their uh, their other agenda as they were going through that that research. So that's a it's a very interesting, mm -hmm. um, e uh, a very interesting episode. But as Carlos uh, says in the chat, there's no evidence of fraud with Piper, mm -hmm. but it is recognized that sometimes she did a little bit of fishing while in trance, so again, unconsciously for right. information, but not enough to c explain the communications that she brought through that were verifiable. Yeah, they, they were really stunningly accurate and specific in so many cases that... Um, yeah. And, you know, as, as we pointed out, you know, Hodson <laughs> spent the better, you know, a good portion of his life, you know, trying to uh, prove that she was a fraud because that was kind of professionally what he did. And <laughs> yeah, sort of, exactly. Sort of failed, you know, but that was good. I mean, that in a sense, uh, you know, he, he basically validated uh, the, the precise thing that he was trying to do and to show that she was not a fraud. Well, and a lot of a, a lot of uh, a lot of the investigators in that era, there were a number of people in our side of the line who either started out as being very skeptical, or uh, maintained the idea that 
you know, this is going to be a mixed bag as we go along. So let's look for the verifiable stuff and then make a determination about how it possibly could have been um, uh, pulled together in a fraudulent way. That was the reason why they followed her around <laughs> with detectives and all that stuff. Yeah. To make sure she wasn't getting, uh, you know, bumping into folks. Um, yeah. Exactly. Carlos has put up the link to Amy Tam Tanner's book, which is another one that we all grumble about. But it's interesting in terms of the methodologies they used and then that how that point of view that she uh, she and her professor Stanley Hall had comes through in their work. So Padin is saying, um, let me go back up a little bit ways here. I just lost it. Some of the skeptics back then suggested, oh, no, this one we already talked about. There's another one. Um, Oh, right. Uh, okay, that one we did already. No evidence of fraud. Um, oh, and Adelson is asking, do, were any of Piper's children known to have a psychic, a psychic ability? Not that I know of, uh, although they didn't really, you know, I haven't seen anybody really alluding to that, but uh, I just know that Alta, I think her name is, uh, wrote a book about her mother. Right, Alta. Um, and a pretty good one, actually. And uh, but she never alluded to the fact that, at least I can remember, that she had, you know, the same kind of abilities her mother did. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's certainly, I mean, Sherry Cohn's work with uh, Second Sight in Scotland showed a genetic, uh, in Scotland, Second Sight is mainly the province of the uh, men in the population, but there was a genetic connection between uh, father and son, especially in psychic ability. Mm -hmm. um, and Lisette is bringing up the notion that Garrett, uh, Eileen Garrett was uh, very interesting because she was ex she thought very deeply about her mediumship and she was very uh, critical also of how it was working and when she you know how did it work where did it come from um, and uh, for that reason was so interested in how the science goes forward and um, and and trying to make herself available for experimentation and for and writing, you know, very reflexively about her experience. And Lisette makes the point that she never disputed the veracity of the information that she brought through from her trans mediumship, but she did often dispute the source mm -hmm. um, and was able to kind of have that conversation with herself about, is this really coming from a discarnate? Is this coming from my other psychic abilities? Is this coming from my imagination? And how does this happen? So I think that's quite, uh, quite easy, uh, quite in informative about how complex the phenomena is. Yeah. Uh, they were talking about modern um, mediums who could be considered to be uh, uh, up to the level of or close to the level of Leonora, Leonora Piper and John Edwards was mentioned. Um, I, I think he started out with a better a better um, reputation than he has these days, but he was involved in some research early on that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and Steve Carr is asking that question too. Do either of you guys or um, anybody know of any current mediums that you would say ha had the same level of accuracy as Leonora Piper? We may, we may, that may be a good question to ask uh, yeah. uh, Julie Beichel as well. Yeah, I was going to say the Winbridge, they, they go through a lot of very rigorous uh, testing. Yep. And uh, only a few people can be uh, admitted to the one bridge, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, I think, I think too, it was easier in those days um, to to draw that kind of experimental uh, wall around, um, you know, an evidential evidence based wall around uh, the. Uh, information produced by uh, mental mediums in the sense that um, we weren't so connected. You know, there's there was no Google, <laughs> there were, was no social media, there were no ways for a person to even uh, come across information and then forget it and bring it up unconsciously uh, if the if the uh, environment or the uh, you know, the sitting kind of required it. So even even to kind of use cryptonesia where you're repeating something that you don't remember having heard somewhere, we're not as awash in all these details. And I think now it would be really hard to prove that somebody was as disconnected from normal sources 
um, as it could be about uh, Leonora Piper and so on. Um, so I don't think we could see, I don't know that, I think it's harder to, to um, make a case that a person would be as good as Leonora Piper now because of all the possibilities of information gathering unconsciously and without any malice or intent to commit fraud. Um, right. Right. But I, I would not, uh, I would be totally surprised if there weren't people out there that are as accurate as she was mm -hmm. and as honest as she was. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, so Marla's talk, Marla's um, giving a good explanation from her training of, of how mediums, mediums are trained. Um, and Mark is saying, uh, when I was in the Rhine Summer Study uh, Program, Dr. Palmer, uh, I guess it was a fellowship, right? I, I just, this thing keeps moving. Hold on a second. Let me go find Mark again. Um, yeah, where it says conversation is basically a conversation. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I just can't. Uh, I'm trying to grab it. I thought I had it. Oh, there we go. Um, whoop, went, went away again. Wait a minute here. Sorry, guys. Uh, accuracy is based on how the medium, uh, what's, let's see, what is he saying? Interprets the, what is it, the message. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's basically a conversation, yeah. And that's a good, that's a good point because, um, because we're dealing with, with uh, mortals here, uh, mortals aren't, you know, totally uh, infallible. And so the medium, you know, could very, you know, could, could obviously make a few mistakes or, and that's been demonstrated, you know, they confuse words or phrases. And I'm, it's perfectly understandable because, you know, it's coming from a kind of a, a subtle source, you know. It's not like somebody in the room uh, communicating with them, you know. It's a completely different kind of thing. So, yeah, so it's not always totally accurate, but the best mediums are very, very accurate. Yeah, and um, uh, they were. There was a discussion going on. Um, uh, um, yeah, Mark's making the point that a great deal of misinterpretation occurs just between living people. Um, uh, the discussion going on about how uh, mediums on television is a whole different ball game. It's sort of like a magician on television in the sense that. There's a production team that edits the raw feed before it's crafted into a television show. So you get all the hits and none of the misses, essentially, which is which is a, another problem and why it's still important for people interested to have face-to-face uh, -face sittings or proxy sittings or something in a more controlled environment to kind of gauge the accuracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Um, Carl, I'm uh, typing away here. Uh, I should just say this, but I'm asking Carlos. Uh, he's offering, he has a PDF of Alta's biography of Leonora Piper on his computer, and he's offering it to send it, anybody in the, send it to anybody in the course who would like it. But Carlos, if you send it to me, I can put it up on the class, uh, uh, in, into the classroom. Um, in the schedule so that everybody has access to it. And that would be a great idea. And I have been going through uh, Lexine and downloading um, articles in which Eleanor Piper is mentioned. I haven't got past the 1980s, so I'm still heading back into the days in which the primary reports were written. But those I can download, put into PDFs and put them into the course room for course, for course uh, use. So don't pass them around folks, but you can have them for your own. Um, Right now, I just have three. A couple of them are contextual, Mark, but I'll just keep going until I get get to the bottom and get them up there. Um, Janine is asking, did she ever indicate, did Lenora herself ever talk about what she thought was going on with her gift? Mm -hmm. And that's interesting because most of the time, as I mentioned in the presentation, she couldn't remember a thing. You know, after she came out of the trance, uh, she didn't remember anything. Um, it's also rather interesting what she said at the end of her life. It's kind of a, a maybe Nancy, you, you can uh, allude to that. Uh, <laughs> because she really, it, it's kind of ironic that of all the people who um, should know the most about what's, what was going on, uh, probably Leonora was, was the least because she was in a trance. And so uh, 
she she uh, describes some some kind of uh, well, I won't say skepticism, but she described it in terms of not not exactly spirits at all times or whatever. Do you remember Nancy or Carlos how that played out with that that famous uh, statement that she made toward the end of her life or whatever? Carlos, that, that's in your bailiwick. I don't know that much about, um, I don't know everything about Leonora, but I wouldn't be surprised. That's kind of the same thing that Lizette was saying Well, um, about Eileen Garrett, that she would believe in the information that came through while she was in trance, but she would be, wonder about the source. Was it imagination? Was it information that she's pulling together from, from um, experience with the sitter or was it coming from a spirit? Was it coming from telepathy of the sitter? That kind of thing. Yeah. And that's sort of the gist, I think of what uh, Leonora was saying, you know, that she, you know, she wasn't entirely convinced or wasn't, wasn't sure what the source was or whether it was coming from spirits or whatever, because she had no way of knowing, you know, right. she was just a conduit and that was it, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I think there's, um, Lizette, you can correct me. I think I remember reading a statement about, or or maybe having a conversation with Mrs. Coley, Lizette's mom, that um, you know Eileen Garrett would be interested in reading the transcripts of her uh, mediumship uh, sessions because she was separated, you know, out of her body, uh, having a different experience when she was in trans mediumship. Um, and uh, Carlos is saying. Uh, uh, Piper had made some statements that were taken as a confession that the thing wasn't coming from spirits, but she later said more clearly that she just didn't know what the source was. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that separation. And probably as Marla was saying earlier on about how mediums today are not too happy about the idea of, of losing all the control and allowing a, a, a spirit to step in that um, mm -hmm. uh, it certainly that, if that kind of experience of being separated from the information you're conveying is a um, was a consternation for Garrett and for Piper too, and probably others as well. And Marla is saying that she thinks true physical mediumship involves a trance state, but mental mediumship does not always require a trance, and that's so true today for sure. Right. And I, uh, in a couple of the people, Joyce Gerber, for instance, who ended up on. Um, uh, you know, got through the training and ended up on uh, uh, Julie's uh, list of, conf of certified mediums. She was uh, at our 2005 study of mediumship conference in Charlottesville, uh, which was a PF international conference. And um, one of the things she said when we were all sitting around chatting in one of the, the uh, cocktail parties was that they, she and um, I forgot the name of the woman she worked with, Nancy, somebody, that um, she and, and this other person had been called in to do a workshop or they would set up a workshop in a state um, that was not the one that they lived in. And they knew that they were going to be ha having some on the side kind of uh, mediumship um, sessions with some of the people at the workshop. I think that's the context. But the key thing she was saying was that on the way uh, the night before in the hotel, they both had dreams that came that where information came through that they then conveyed as well, or they would start getting psychic impressions and that some of her problem in terms of her own practice, um, I think she said had to do with this sort of, don't give me the info now, wait till I, I'll kind of like, let me not, not get this all thing worked out before I get there. Um, and I think Joe Monagle, uh, McMonagall also mentioned that about his uh, uh, psychic ability and remote viewing, that sometimes the stuff started coming in before the session ha uh, happened. Mm -hmm. um, so there's also that. Yeah, right. Yeah, Mark is saying um, the resistance, uh, new mediums experience is about control and not about letting a spirit take control. He said mediumship is like surrendering, surrendering to mindfulness. That's a lovely way to put it. I agree with uh, Morgan about that. Yeah, that's my problem with uh, meditation. I don't like to give up my control. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I prefer to knit. <laughs> I'm still, I'm, I'm lost in a single focus, but I'm in charge. <laughs> yeah. So 
so Patricia says, so long as it isn't cold reading or fraud of some kind, then you still have some type of side phenomena going on. Yeah, exactly. And it's still impressive, regardless of the exact conduit of the information. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, any more questions or comments? Yeah, Morgan says that's a common adult thing these days. We have trouble letting go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's an ego thing. <laughs> yeah, it's an ego thing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's and Mark is saying, yeah, we sur we surrender to our phones now. <laughs> yeah, some of us definitely do. Yeah. Mine doesn't work in the house, thank God. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that very often. So uh, Carlos is saying again, uh, thanks, Phil. This has been fascinating. I think we're all really, um, she's really a, a, well, she's the white crow. She's she's really a, 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 a an interesting case on every single level, I must say. And that whole era, you know, it goes back 100 years. So a lot of people sort of tend to forget what's going on. Um, you know, I'm reading about Houdini right now and his connections with some of the mediums. And it's quite fascinating because there was so much interest in those days. And, uh, you know, everybody was kind of transfixed with the whole idea of spiritualism. And it was just it's just a, it was just a very interesting period uh, historically, you know, that we sort of tend to forget about. So, yeah, I think it was it was fascinating that whole end of the well, the 19th century, there was. Um, well, the whole 19th century, I guess, th there was this notion that our, our religious practices should be more scientific, that we should be able to get evidence for the concepts we're believing in ourselves. And um, certainly spiritism sees itself as a science of life. And uh, many of the many of the folks who were doing home circles and all that stuff in the middle of the 19th century were testing things out for themselves as well. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a very different, a very different kind of a, an era. We're sort of, I don't know where we are now in terms of religion and science, but at that point there was yeah. a very active um, effort to try and meld them even in spirituality. Yeah. Um, well, uh, religious attendance is going down. I just read a, uh, a study about that, you know, where people are not going to church as much now. And there's more of a sort of a, uh, moving toward sort of general spiritualism rather than any particular religion. So yeah, spirituality. Yeah. So, yeah. As um, I was reading recently that the, um, I think we hit a point where atheists are now 25% of the responses on mm -hmm. uh, Gallup polls and agnostics a bit more. So you see people, uh, the rise in people who say none, um, in terms of religion uh, is pronounced, but also so is the rise in people saying that they're spiritual. So there's still this this um, connection to spirituality, but it's it's not so much in the it's not as much in the organized yeah. religious context as it used to be. Yeah. Hey, millennials, that's what's interesting. You know, yeah, like, yeah, they're certainly reinventing everything for us. Yeah, really, yeah, so. So Carlos is mentioning uh, Deborah Bloom's book, Ghost Hunters, uh, William James and the Search for Scientific Proof of Life After Death. That's an excellent book and, yeah. and it's available on Amazon. Yeah, it really is. That's a very good book. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Well, um, thank you very much. Um, we've hit 90 minutes and I, I think uh, it's clear from the chat box that everybody really enjoyed the the presentation and certainly there's a lot to be learned from the life of Leonora Piper and from mediumship in general. Let's see if we can go back and find that beautiful picture of Leonora Piper. <laughs> we can thank you yes. properly. This is my favorite picture. It reminds me of some of the photographs that were taken of Mrs. Coley when she was young by a friend of hers who was a great photographer. That's a very nice picture. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully, and if not, we'll see you around the classroom, and thank you, Phil, for all your effort. This was great. Sure. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.